This is Naples, or Napoli in Italian, or Napoli in Neapolitan. Not sure about the Neapolitan pronunciation though. Naples is a capital of Campania region in Italy. It's a coastal sunny region full of history, brilliant food, delicious wine, and piles of rubbish on the street. I took all the footage during Easter in 2023. It wasn't as sunny as it could be a month later, but let's start from the beginning. People have been living here since the Stone Age, but the first, let's say, civilization found its way here in the 8th century BC. It was Greeks and this was actually their first city on the Italian peninsula. They called it Parthenope. Right after they drove away Etruscans from the area that is. The name surrounds a legend of Parthenope, which was a siren who tried to entice Ulysses with her singing. However, Ulysses was immune to her singing. Parthenope couldn't bear the weight of her failure and killed herself. Her body was washed up on a shore and the city that was built there was named after her. Etruscans didn't give up that easily and regained the dominance over the area and the town. Under their, let's say, governance, the town started to decline, but Greeks managed to establish their supremacy and regain the dominance once again. The town was rebuilt and renamed to Paleopolis, roughly translated, Old City. Lots of new settlers flowed in and founded new settlements around Campania coastal region, and as the region was growing, a larger port was needed. It was built a bit more to the south of Paleopolis, and also a larger city arose around it, and this new city was called Neapolis, meaning New City. Sometime around the 4th century BC, the city was conquered by Romans and further modernized with Roman aqueducts, watering places, and Roman roads connecting the city with the rest of the Italian peninsula. The walls of the first fortification can still be seen at Piazza Bellini and Piazza Calenda. The walls survived 3,000 years of wars and harsh weather, yet today they face something even more destructive – modern human population. And from here, we can plunge ourselves into the magical streets of Naples. Some of these streets and buildings are here for centuries. You can walk around the city for hours and keep discovering new places, buildings, sites, etc. But this video can't run for hours, so let's shorten the time and let me show you the most interesting parts I've discovered while running about the city and its vicinity. Since we're here on Piazza Bellini, let's walk down Via Sebastiano and we'll end up in a street chock full of street vendors selling various stuff, mostly rubbish. This is one of the most touristy streets in Naples, and as such, it's not uncommon to find some strange characters here. The street led us to Piazza del Gesù Nuovo, New Jesus Square. At first sight, it's just an ordinary square with sort of ordinary buildings, but what's behind its walls is quite extraordinary. This looks like an ordinary building, but when you enter, you find out it's one of the most magnificent churches you've ever seen. The church bears the same name as the square, Chiesa di Gesù Nuovo. Chiesa, of course, means church in Italian. The church's got quite interesting history. It's got this unusual facade for one reason. It was built in 1470, but not as a church, but as a palace for Prince of Salerno. The palace was later confiscated and sold to Jesuits to rebuild the palace to a church. It was rebuilt by an Italian architect and Jesuit priest, Giuseppe Valeriano. And boy, did he rise to the occasion. Near the New Jesus Church, there's a famous street, Via Toledo. Via Toledo has been one of the most important streets in Naples since 16th century. It was named after a viceroy of Naples, Pedro Alvarez de Toledo, but between years 1870 and 1980, it was called Via Roma, in honor of the new capital of Kingdom of Italy. Via Toledo was one of the main streets connecting important squares, Piazza Dante and Piazza Trieste e Trento, and thus administrative and financial institutions sprung up here in large numbers. The street is chock a block with stalls, shops and people, mostly tourists, but I'm a tourist as well, so I'm adding my share to the place. There's nothing particularly interesting here except for a couple of historical buildings nowadays, so if you despise crowds, just avoid this street, you're not missing on anything, I reckon. You can certainly use one of the smaller streets in Spanish quarters, they run parallel to the Toledo. Roughly in the middle of the Toledo street, there's the Toledo tube station, which is there since 2012. It is said to be one of the most beautiful underground stations in Europe, so let's have a gander if it's true or not. 
When you get off the tube, it looks like a pretty ordinary station, but when you walk up the stairs, you're greeted with this. Now you decide, is it or is it not one of the most beautiful stations? Via Toledo takes us directly to Piazza del Plebiscito. On one side of the square, you can visit the Royal Palace of Naples, which used to be used for housing all sorts of nobility from viceroys to kings. It's mainly a museum and a tourist attraction nowadays. On the other side of the square is Basilica Reale Pontificia San Francesco da Paola, which was inspired by Pantheon in Rome. It was unfortunately closed for public when I was there. This magnificent square is often used for events, concerts, etc. All just people sitting around and enjoying the view. Or kids playing football. Let's crack on with the tour this way. It will take us to the seaside and the port of Naples. It's a massive port used for all sorts of sea transportations. But the port itself is not so interesting, so let's enjoy the straw watching both sides of the shore. On one side is a sea of people getting tanned. The other side is full of interesting architecture that's much more modern than the one we saw around Via Toledo. The promenade took us to another landmark, Castel de Lovo, meaning Egg Castle. The castle is built on this strangely named little island, Mega Ride. It's the oldest castle in Naples built by Normans in 12th century and the actual place where Greeks built the foundations of the city and the first harbour that was discovered recently underwater right next to the castle. It's basically ruins of Paleopolis. Also, this is the place where Parthenope's body was washed up on a shore. Sometime in the 19th century, a tiny fisherman's village called Borgo Marinaro sprang up next to the castle. The village became, as pretty much all nice places, a tourist trap with lots of restaurants and bars. However, having a dinner on the wharf with this beautiful view on the city is sort of magical and it's kind of worth it. From the castle, let's take a stroll a bit to the west from where we've already been. We end up in a part of Naples that was built around the 16th century and is called Quartieri Spagnoli, Spanish Quarters. The Spanish Quarters are considered being a part of historic center of Naples. The Spanish Quarters are called Spanish Quarters because it was built to accommodate Spanish soldiers that were passing through quite frequently at the time. The entire area became quickly densely populated, but it attracted some shady people and it got riddled with crime, prostitution and gambling. Soldiers slowly disappeared and people from surrounding towns moved in. The streets in here are very narrow, but some cars can certainly fit here. However, don't expect anything larger than many to get through. So don't even think about going here with your ram. People usually drive scooters to get around. You can hardly see a motorbike though. This part of Naples is famous for its laundry. It may sound weird, but you can see clothes and bedclothes hanging pretty much everywhere around Naples, but Spanish quarters especially. This is a nice contrast between rawish, dirty streets and freshly washed and neatly hanged clothes. Speaking of dirty streets, Naples may be a put-off for somebody who can't stand a bit of a dirt. The streets are chock full of all sorts of rubbish and dog shit, so sometimes the stench is rather strong. Also, due to the city's heavy traffic, the air is heavily polluted. As you may have noticed from my footage, there's lots of stuff hanging next to the clothes all over Naples. It's cause when I was there, some sort of football championship was just on, and for some reason Neapolitans are addicted to football, particularly to one man who's ever-present and whom you can see pretty much everywhere all over Naples. If you're guessing Jesus, he comes second, right after Diego Maradona. 
As you may know, he was an Argentinian football player who between years 1984 and 1991 played for the Napoli club and since then he became sort of saint around here, despite his, let's say, transgressions. Even a local stadium is named after him. As I was speaking about weather traffic, it reminds me what you can see, or maybe can't see, all over Naples. And they say car without any scratch marks. Pretty much all cars in Naples show some sign of crash or battering, or at least scratching and grazing. I came to Naples by my own car, and I was a bit surprised I left without any scratch mark on the paintwork. While walking through the street, you come across lots of local shops or even whole street markets. The stores are chock full of fish and seafood, vegetable and fruit, you may find some useful stuff here and there, or just rubbish. Fresh produce is nice, but we're in Italy, and Italy, well, that's pizza. Everybody knows that pizza is an Italian dish, its history is long and uncertain, however, not many people know that pizza, as we all know and love today, originated here, in Naples. It was 1889, 18 years after the unification of Italy, Queen Margherita of Savoy was visiting Naples and local chef Raffaele Esposito came up with a dish to honour her. Of course it was pizza, he called it Margherita and made it in colours of an Italian flag. A tomato for red, mozzarella for white and basil for green. Even though Margherita may seem a bit basic, it's one of the best pizzas when made properly. Speaking of volcanic soil, it's here due to none other than Mount Vesuvius. Vesuvius is towering over the entire Bay Area, you can see the volcano from pretty much everywhere. Getting up there is not very difficult, a scenic road meanders from its base almost to the top, you can get there by car, bus or you can just walk. When the road ends you need to pay outrageous entrance fee and you can crack on walking to the very top. Just a quick tip. If you're planning on going there, you have to buy the tickets beforehand, there's no way of buying them on the spot. It reeks of sulfur in there, of course, and you can see smoke coming out of the crater here and there, which indicates the volcano is far cry from dead. Vesuvius had erupted numerous times in the past, and there are some actual photos of the most recent eruption in 1944. I managed to dig up even older photo, it's from 1872. Apart from the crater itself, you can see the entire Naples Bay and surrounding towns from the top of Vesuvius, usually under cover of a smog blanket. Two small towns you can see from up here, and also two most affected by the infamous eruption in 79 AD, are Pompeii and Herculaneum, or Ercolano in Italian. Everybody knows the story of Pompeii and Herculaneum's tragedy, but for those who do not, here's a short version. It was year 79, Pompeii was a posh town right on the southern base of Mount Vesuvius. It was an ordinary day in Pompeii and a couple of minor earthquakes occurred, but since people were used to minor tremors, they didn't pay attention to them. A couple of days later, the eruptions began. They lasted two days and had two stages. During the first stage, the volcano spewed up 19 mile high column chock full of pumice, ash and hot gas, which started raining all over the region. People who didn't escape got to see the second stage though. During the second stage, a pyroclastic flow gushed out of the volcano, scorching everything it touched. A pyroclastic flow is not your average slowly flowing lava you can see in documentaries. It's a fast moving mix of hot air and all sorts of volcanic stuff that can reach speeds up to 400 miles per hour and up to 1000 degrees centigrade. Pompeii, Herculaneum and a couple of neighbouring villas were buried under 20 meter high volcanic materials. Today, Pompeii and Herculaneum are completely different towns. Apart from the dig sites, there's pretty much nothing interesting in there. The towns are boring and dull. As for the dig sites themselves, they are full of history. Amazing places, you'll be able to see how people lived before the eruption. Almost everything was preserved by the lava. It's really worth visiting. The ticket prices are through the roof though. If you ask me which one of these sites you should visit if you've gone one day, I'd probably recommend Herculaneum. Even though the dig sites might smaller, it seems a bit more interesting to me and since it's not as famous as Pompeii, the tickets cost a lot less and there's a lot less people as well. 
Further down the south is a part of the region that was also a little bit affected by the eruption. It's a famous Amalfi Coast. It's a peninsula full of hills, historical towns and cities and surrounded by a crystal clear water. It's a really nice little spend day or two driving alongside the peninsula coastline and visiting some cities and towns along the way. There's also a couple of gorgeous places to take a short hike. We took a hike from a small town called Termine to Campanella Headland. It took about an hour of walk to get there and it rewarded us with some stunning views. The most famous cities are probably Sorrento, Positano, Ravello and Amalfi. While Sorrento, Positano and Ravello are beautiful cities, Amalfi is the literal definition of a tourist trap. It starts at the car park where you have to pay 6 euros for an hour. 6 euros is about 6.5 US dollars or about 5 quid. I haven't seen anything this outrageous anywhere all over Italy. After a couple of minutes you get to Piazza Duomo, where you can see gorgeous St. Andrea Cathedral. And that's it, that's literally the only interesting thing the town offers. Sure, if you're desperate for some local trinkets, you can visit some of the overpriced shops next to the square. I wouldn't waste any time in this town. Ravello on the flip side is certainly worth wasting time. It's a small but beautiful city right above Amalfi. Unfortunately, I haven't got any footage from there. A couple of miles past Amalfi is Positano. It's a gorgeous seaside city. You can spend a couple of hours walking about and discovering what the city's got to offer. Beautiful streets, nice church, local shops and nice restaurants with a view on the sea. A beach is a bit horrible there during the summertime, but beaches are horrible everywhere during summer, so... Another city you shouldn't miss down the road is Sorrento. Again, I don't have any footage from there, but it's worth visiting. Mount Vesuvius is not the only volcano in the vicinity. In fact, the entire Bay Area is one big supervolcano. And that brings me to the other side of Naples Bay, to Flegrian Field, Campi Flegre in Italian, which means burning field. And it's a rather fitting name for this part of Naples. It's a large area on the outskirts of Naples, between Naples and Pozzuoli, where you can see and smell volcanic activity pretty much any time of the year. The area is closed to public, at least it was when I was there, so it's not really worth visiting. While we are in Pozzuoli, we can visit the third largest Roman amphitheatre called Flavian Amphitheatre. The only larger ones are Amphitheatre in Capua and of course Colosseum in Rome. Unfortunately, when I was there, it wasn't accessible to the public, unless... As you can see, it's well preserved and very well maintained. These exterior walls used to be covered with marble, but it was taken down some time during the Middle Ages. There's the second largest Neapolitan port in Pozzuoli, and lots of ships and ferries come in and out all day long. You can board one of the ferries and get for instance to Ischia or Procida, which are two islands near the mainland. It takes about half an hour to get to Procida and about an hour to get to Ischia. I left my car in a car park in the port and boarded the ferry to Procida. It's a gorgeous little island, of course created by an eruption of local volcanoes. If you get there in the morning, you'll be able to crisscross it by the afternoon and you can be back in Naples by evening. The historical centre takes up about half of the island, but don't let it stop you from visiting the rest. Like there, you can get away from the ever-present crowds lurking behind every corner. I was on the island on Good Friday, which is when you get to see one of the local traditional processions, called Procession of the Mysteries. It's a parade where local males dressed in the traditional dress, young and old alike, walk about the city carrying handmade allegorical carts and wagons, displaying mostly biblical stories and characters, thus the mysteries. Now let's go back to Naples. When you get off the ferry and you haven't got a car, you can take a train back to Naples. It takes you to Monte Santo Square, which is not far from the city centre. Apart from a train, bus or tube, there are also four funicular lines, three of which go uphill to the Mero district. There are two reasons a tourist would want to go there, to visit Castel Sant'Elmo and a beautiful view from Castel Sant'Elmo. It used to be some sort of residence in the 13th century, later rebuilt to a palace, then castle, and after it was damaged by an earthquake, it was rebuilt again to what you can see today. From here, you can see the entire Naples Bay from the other side than from Vesuvius, including Vesuvius itself. 
Looking down on the city, you can see how all those magnificent monuments look from above. For instance, famous Galleria Umberto. There's nothing particularly interesting in the Galleria than the Galleria itself. There's just a couple of useless shops and terrible McDonald's, but the building itself is an astounding piece of architecture built in 1890. Looking at the city from up here, you may notice there is no larger freshwater source and I was wondering, where does Naples get fresh water? I found out it comes from a spring about 40 miles away, in a small town called Terino. It's not anything special today to pipe the water this far, however, fresh water for Naples was always supplied from there and it was one of the most magnificent Roman constructions that was supplying the water from Serino to Naples and most of the neighbouring cities and towns. It was called Aqua Augusta or Serino Aqueduct because it was built during the Augustus period sometime around 30 BC. The bloody thing was about 60 miles long and with all its 14 branches about 100 miles. It supplied water to Pompeii, Herculaneum, lots of towns along the way and of course Naples. Pompeii branch was cut off in 79 AD and was never rebuilt for obvious reasons. Given its length, the maintenance was very difficult and pricey and after another major eruption in 472 AD, they stopped repairing the aqueduct and it slowly crumbled away and almost disappeared over the time. I've managed to track down some of the remains, not too many can be found around the original path though. Most of the remains remain underground, part of which you can visit here. It's an astonishing journey even if you're not after the Sereno aqueduct and it doesn't take more than two hours of your time. The underground is larded with ancient tunnels and cisterns, it was used as a bomb shelter during the World War II and you can even see a Greek theatre in there. Part of the underground is used as a sort of World War II museum. I also wanted to see some not so famous or rather infamous part of Naples. And Scampia is such a part. It's a district on the northern outskirts of Naples and it's considered to be the most dangerous district in all of Europe. And as such, I wanted to see how it looks like in there. After I walked in with my camera, it took about 5 minutes and I was stopped by a bloke who told me I shouldn't be there and that it's a dangerous place. I didn't heed his warning and cracked on. It looks like a ghost town for most part. I was there for about 3 or 4 hours and met about 10 people, from which 5 were some sort of drug dealers who tried to sell something to me. The area is controlled by Camorra, one of the oldest mafia clans in Italy. I didn't feel frightened or threatened in there, it certainly felt safer than for instance Detroit or Cleveland. Apart from standard Italian language, you'll also hear Neapolitan or Napoletano all around Naples. Napoletano is considered a different language rather than an Italian dialect. Maybe something like English versus Scottish Gaelic or Scottish English for the matter. As I was told, normal Italian or Sicilian doesn't understand Napoletano. However, people of Naples can, of course, speak standard Italian but with Neapolitan accent and can switch back and forth. I've been to Naples about 10 times already and every time it seems sort of new to me. I keep discovering new places and it's always cracking experience. When I first took my missus to Naples, she was appalled. Some parts of the city can be outright disgusting. However, after some time, she fell in love with the city and Neapolitans. And pretty much every time we go to Italy, she wants to go to Naples. That being said, Naples is one of the must-see destinations in Italy. You may never want to see the city again or you just get addicted to it. There's nothing in between. And that's the end of this documentary. If you've got something to say, leave a comment. And if you're into retro and vintage stuff, check out my other channel, which is in the description. See you next time. Cheers.